I wanted to know like your best writing style. Like I saw the New Yorker stuff, but he um there was a book, I, I guess a fictional book. Can you explain this book to me? It was sort of like a fictionalized yeah. version of Sly. Okay, so this is sort of the weird, the bizarre genesis of this project, which is that I was obsessed with Sly and the Family Stones music since I was a kid, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. I bought greatest hits on cassette. I wore it out. I what do you call that little brush at the bottom on the metal of the cassette? I when you double stick tape it because it falls off and you have to put right. it back on. Right. Well, I repaired the cassette so I could keep hearing it. Many and years. And what, what year did you buy this? 78, 79, whatever. I was when I was 77, 78, 79, something like that. And you uh, brought it, seven. or like was it in your house? No, no. I I was starting to buy cassettes. I, my first set of cassettes, whatever was coming out around then, like it, it was probably Hall and Oates and Elton John, and I got onto the slide, Billy Joel, and I just got the slide. Like I, I had heard the songs, the biggest songs on the radio, because we all okay. have. And I love the cover photo and the cover photo we can get back to as a sort of end cap, because to me, that is the kind of metaphor. It's this one guy sitting in the car and then all these iterations of other people just flowering from his head. And it's a kind of amazing metaphor for what the project was. But but I just heard the music and I I loved all the hugest hits. And then as I explored, as I got to be 12, 13, and I was buying all the other records, Records and I just got obsessed. The, the way I put it is that with most pop music, if you hear enough of it, if I play you a minute and then I pause the song and I say, okay, tell me what you think the next 10 seconds will be. You know, I mean, I you certainly know, and I know in most cases, mm -hmm. you, you have a sense of the rhythm, you have a sense of the structure. The idiosyncrasies of Sly, even within a pop music context, were amazing. Like you can hear a minute of, thankful and thoughtful, hit the pause. I don't really know what's going to happen. I don't know from, from down to like the, the actual rhythms of the song and drumming over the machines to there's a lyrical left turn or some bizarre resurfacing of another song. I just, he was very surprising and very, I, I was fascinated that somebody could not be predictable. And then as I later found out in life, as well as on the music. So mm -hmm. my early 20s, mid 20s i thought about writing a straightforward biography just like this is the story i'm a journalist this is what happened as mm -hmm. i researched it i would find things that upset me and i was too young and i didn't really know how to do it and i didn't want to do it in that way i didn't want to be the one to say i found out all these negative things about this person who i idolize and here they are so i stopped and i converted it to a novel which was a composite really of Sly and Marvin Gaye, a little bit of Curtis Mayfield, uh, dustings of Swamp Dog and Durando and whoever else, you know, just, mm. it was like a funk star in, in large part Sly and in large part Marvin Gaye, because they're, I kind of mashed up the different aspects of the tragedies of their life. That right. novel, it sold okay, but it seemed to find its way to music people. One of those people was rich, and one of those people was someone in George's camp, George Clinton's camp. So around the same time, I think you're a year ahead of George. I think your book came out in 13, and George's in 14. Right. Pretty soon after we wrote Mometa, I got a call that George wanted was looking for a, a co-writer for his memoir. And that was also in his equation. So he had been like, wow, the sensibility here is kind of interesting and it's a different kind of storytelling. And it's it really seems to be presenting a voice rather than just analyzing. And it's, I don't know, non-judgmental about certain aspects of the lifestyle and something about it he liked. And then when I met him, I just made a couple of jokes and he liked the jokes. Like he, the joke I made is with George, he, he was going through some legal stuff and I said, he had all this paperwork and I said, you should print it all on underwear and then just wear that on stage and sell them and call them legal briefs. And he said, oh my God, that's so funny. He didn't do it. But I think <laughs> he liked that idiotic idea. Yeah, something I was going to say, that's it. such a George Clinton thing to, right. and so that's how, that's how you had him. It's like entrepreneurial insanity. And he's like, uh, oh, and so, so something about it he liked. So anyway, I did that book. 
we did all of our books and George in the, as I finished up that book, I remember sitting in the car with Archie Ivy, uh, George's right hand guy. And, and it, when we were finishing up George's book and saying, I'd really love to do Sly's book. And, and the feeling at the, at that point was, I don't know, man, like he, it's not like a super, um, constructed situation over there right now the architecture is weird he's still using obviously at that time which means that mm -hmm. most of the uh goal in an average day is to manage that part of life and i was connected to his camp and the people were great they were very nice and and he was very receptive it just didn't come together in a structured way we would make agreements uh, I think journalists have written about this, so I'm not telling tales out of school, but to do an interview, someone would say, we need a thousand up front. And I would say, no, 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 no. I, we're talking about a partnership on a book deal. I'm not, this is not how this works. I'm not buying today's, you know, delivery. So you're basically saying that artists now charge for interviews? I think they needed money so he could score. I, I mean, right. maybe, this is just my interpretation and in that, they knew as the people who were helping him that the main goal was to get cash for that day. And it was very short-sighted and very short-term. So we wrote up a bunch of agreements and they all collapsed. We'd start to redline them to make them more professional. And I'd say, well, I'll agree to this, but not to this. And then it just never happened. And I would say to my wife every year, I'm still trying for this. I mean, George is still optimistic. He says, He'll connect me to this new guy who's with him or this person, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it's a, a doable thing. Then mm -hmm. in 2019, Arlene, who had been Sly's girlfriend in the 80s and sort of re-entered the camp, she had broken up with Sly, gone and worked in the legal industry, gotten married, built a, a straight life such as it was, and then came back in as a kind of management helper. So that's her industry. And so she was able to help him execute certain kinds of correspondence or or to process things or to say to him the practical part she was really strong on like you can't forget to do this thing by thursday or if you can't we got to ask for send a note saying we need more time you know that kind of stuff so she called me in 2019 and i guess it had come to her attention that this book had been on the table and she was very positive about it and then i hung up and told my wife oh my god i think it might happen like there's a real infrastructure then they disappeared for six months. And I was despondent and I thought, okay, well, this is the final nail in the coffin. I later learned that when they resurfaced that it was because he was getting clean and she didn't think there was any way he could do the book if he was still using. Plus he had immediate health issues as he was trying to get clean. Mm -hmm. When he got clean at the end of 19, she called me again. So we agreed, we got a contract ready. We signed to do the book and went immediately into COVID. And I thought COVID would kill it and it's in the crib. As it turned out, COVID really helped it because everyone was in one place. She didn't have to go to her office every day so she could be with Sly Moore at his house, keeping him focused and explaining to him what it would take to do this. And it was a different process than the usual book. If you and I do a book or I do a book with George, it's a certain number of long conversations because of Sly's health and his energy we were capped at 15, 20 minutes sometimes. So we had to do a lot of conversations that were shorter, which I don't think would have happened without her because she she would, you know, remind him, we got to do this for the book. We, this is important. Let's keep doing this. And we got a runway in that first six months inside of the COVID cylinder where he really committed to the process, um, which was great. I, I mean, she has a credit on the book for that reason. It says created in collaboration with her because truthfully, had she not helped to keep him focused in those early months, it could have easily dissipated. Um, and that was how it happened. I mean, that's sort of the backstory. And the, and the weird part, like you said, initially is that the weird fiction book that came out of my not wanting to confront this person's real life ended up very roundabout leading me back to the door of this memoir so so that it was it's strange it's one of those things in life that you know who knows i i like to think that rich knew <laughs> my theory is that rich knew all this stuff 15 years ago and he figured it all out and he had it all mapped and he's like ben wrote this novel but if i do this 
Amir will be able to do this, and eventually Ben will get back to the memoir. So in my mind, this exactly. is already planned. Yeah, he, he probably knew it was going to happen. It's, it's so weird. Even after uh, I finished uh, reading it, I was like, well, I guess he'll really do Sly's book like for real. It's like I always knew it was going to happen, which I don't know if you ever felt like it was never going to happen or whatever. So I thought it wouldn't. And, and then and then again, because of the nature of his life now, which I didn't really know, I had heard all the stories that you had heard and we had heard them all. I didn't know what the person would be able to do. And I was really pleasantly surprised. I mean, his physical condition is is iffy. Mm -hmm. mentally he was good i had heard all the stories that you had heard of him one sentencing journalists or you know having an answering machine message that said did you call and then it would just hang up on people or whatever not not a super accessible guy but i think that double gatekeeper thing of george and arlene made him at least provisionally trust the process which is always his issue you know? so oh okay no, no, I was just going to say being ill-used or feeling like he was ill-used by media for so many years mm -hmm. kind of made the poster boy of, you know, junkie failure and lost promise and all this kind of stuff that really bugged him. I think he needed to understand that it wasn't coming from that side because his back was up. I, th I think his back was up for decades in some ways. And then to get to the real guy who can be kind of gentle and funny and uh playful as well as all those other things i mean he certainly can be difficult and and stubborn mm -hmm. but uh that provisional trust was really important 